Last night I was elected as moderator of this 44th General Assembly. And uh, someone asked me before I uh, was elected that if I were, uh, how do I see my life or God having prepared my life for this moment? It was a very searching question, and the, the answer I gave was one that I still believe even more deeply in my heart, and that is that, that God uh, chose me in, in order to encourage this 44-year-old denomination. Because uh, among the many things we will do, perhaps the most important thing we will do in this General Assembly is explore not whether we are going to repent of our racism in the past, but how we're going to do it. And so it struck me that here is someone who grew up in Alabama uh, in a small town with a racist subculture, a place where the uh, national headquarters of the White Knights of the Ku Klux Klan uh, was. And that was a culture that I lived in uncritically for the formative years of my life. And God not only saved me from my sins as a middle schooler and, and brought me to Christ, He also planted the gospel in me that will not allow racism to endure. And God worked that miracle, has worked that miracle in me gradually over the years to deliver me from my racism. And then in His providence brought me to pastor a 212-year-old church in Augusta that was built originally with a slave gallery in 1804. It was the founding uh, place of the Presbyterian Church in the Confederate States of America ostensibly founded for uh, freedom. But you dig down a little bit, you understand they're, they're, they're founded, the denomination was founded because they wanted to preserve their way of life, which included slavery. And uh, through the powerful, sometimes messy work of the gospel, God has taken that congregation from that racist past, even to the point of having pastors who preached countenancing slavery from the pulpit, delivered that church to the point that we're moving aggressively toward becoming a, a multi-ethnic congregation. So I say, God hasn't elected me, or I wasn't elected in God's providence because I deserved the honor, and not because I'm the best moderator of such a meeting. But I think he can say through a life like mine, if I can deliver Robertson from racism, this 50-year-old man, and, and, and change him by the gospel into someone who's being used for reconciliation, if I can deliver this 212-year-old denomination from its racist past, I can surely do this for the PCA, who's only 44 years old. And we saw that so powerfully, objectively manifested yesterday in the African American Presbyterian Fellowship luncheon. 52 uh, African American teaching elders in the denomination and other uh, ruling elders there as well. And uh, a luncheon that was black and white and, and Asian. Uh, God is already doing it. So I, I want to give encouragement, not just to the denomination, but I want to give encouragement to other pastors and elders and laymen in our predominantly white denomination, predominantly white congregations, to say, if God can do this kind of work in our church, He can do it in any church. And uh, not to give a formula to say, do it this way. We, it's been God's work in us, and that's the encouragement I want to pass on to, to 
to other congregations. And I, I would say it in, in these several ways. Number one, I would say the, 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 the way to move toward a diversity in our congregations that, as we pray, would reflect the complexion of heaven. A way to move toward the first step to moving toward a diversity that communicates to the watching world that the gospel really does break down walls of separation and bring reconciliation. The first step is to, is to, is to get right. It's to, it's to repent. Uh, of, of one of my colleagues on staff says, you know, the, the best leadership is to lead with repentance. There, there's, there's never anything more appropriate in any relationship or any task than to lead with repentance, because repentance is always appropriate. John Calvin called, his word for the Christian life was repentance. And repentance is not just expressing sorrow for our sin, as the, as the catechism says, but it's a full purpose of an endeavor after new obedience. So one of the first things that happened in, at First Presbyterian was we hosted a, a, a mayor's prayer breakfast, a, a gathering of our mayor, our previous, our current mayor is a Christian, our previous mayor was a Christian, and he really uh, was committed to prayer. And so every month, without fail, he called together a prayer meeting, moved it around to different churches, and we were uh, one of the first churches, maybe the first church to hold the prayer meeting. I was, uh, I had been at uh, the church very long, maybe less than a year. And <clears throat> as I went up front to welcome everyone to our church for this prayer meeting, I had to walk past the plaque that was at the very front of our, car, our, of our sanctuary, very prominently displayed, which was uh, commemorating the founding of the Presbyterian Church, Confederate States of America, and the rationale. I walked past that plaque. I looked at the composition of the group gathered. It was mostly African American, which is reflective of our, of, of our zip code, of our, of, of our immediate neighborhood, 85% African American. They were, so predominantly African American, behind me was framed this plaque commemorating why we formed the Confederate Church. And I knew it was a mandate from God that the very first thing I had to do was to repent in front of this, in front of this group. My elders and colleagues were there too, and it's not anything that we planned, but I, I had to say, look at this plaque. I want you to know that we are ashamed of that past. I want you to know that we're repentant of that value that we had at one time in this congregation in a denomination that said, we will form a separate denomination in order to preserve slavery. And I want you to know not uh, that we are repentant of that, that we are going to practice new obedience in that regard. And I ask your forgiveness and ask you to befriend us. I didn't think, I mean, I, I just knew that was something that had to be done, but that moment is referenced regularly in our relationships in the city. And a similar moment occurred when we were, this was years later, after we had built some, some relationships and some trust in the community across racial boundaries, and we were asked to host the Martin Luther King Jr. celebration. It was the largest gathering for the Martin Luther King Day in its history, 25 years or so of history in, the, in our city. And it was the first time that it was half white and half black. And again, without a lot of planning, I knew I had to say something. And what I said was something like this, that we are fiercely repenting of our racist past. We ask the community's forgiveness. And we have been set free by the power of the gospel. 
it's the only power sufficient to break down these kinds of walls that we build as sinful human beings. And I invited the community to pray with me for revival, not just in our local churches, but in our city. So that I said that we all would repent of our segregation on Sunday mornings and to pray for the day when, when, when people come to Augusta, they would ask, where is the closest white church? And someone would say, we don't have any white churches. Well, where's the closest black church? We don't have any black churches. Where's the closest Korean church? We don't have a Korean church. We just have churches of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that uh, leading with that kind of repentance personally being, and being frank and open about my own past, not blaming just my forefathers, but repenting personally and repenting corporately, we have found opens incredible doors to relationship across which the gospel, gospel can be carried evangelistically or by which partnerships can be created for ministry. So, so the very first thing is, is to get right. And to, to get right is not only repenting of the past, but it's endeavoring thereafter to be newly obedient, the power of the Holy Spirit. So I'd say the next thing that we've learned that anybody can do is to get near, is to, is to build relationships, real friendships, when I, when I uh, soon after I'd come to Augusta, there was a, a new pastor also at um, the largest uh, African-American church down the street from us, and someone put us together for lunch. And I expressed my, my desire to him for, for breaking down these racial walls and together partnering to, to uh, bring healing to our our historically segregated city. And he asked a very searching question. He said, are you really serious about that? Are you really serious about a relationship? Are you really serious about doing some stuff? Or you just want to get together and have some worship services and sing Kumbaya and feel good and sing, we shall overcome, but then leaving and pretending that we can never overcome. I said, I know what I want. I want the real deal to occur. I want us to do stuff together. That began a friendship. And, and it led to other friendships. And those friendships can only be nurtured across racial uh, presumed racial divides, they can only be nurtured like any relationship. You've got to spend time with each other. And you've got to spend time having fun with each other. You've got to spend, you've got to get to that point where you have disagreements and you work through them. You've got to, you, you, you've got to do some things together that, um, that involve some risk. You're taking some risk. Uh, one of my other friends who also happens to be African-American, one of my very closest friends, asked me early on in our relationship, I was, I was saying, you, you know, our relationship is too formal. You, you can call me George. Or, no, he said, I want to keep the accountability for now. I didn't ask him to unpack that. I, I wasn't quite sure I wanted to hear that. But he eventually said, I will know we're friends when I see that you are willing to take risks to be my friend. That was bone chilling. But in God's providence, those occasions have arisen where I've had to take risks in public with my congregation uh, in matters of public justice in loyalty, not just to my friend, but to, for, for what is right. 
And what's humbled me is to realize that in, in my context anyway, for an African-American, especially African-American pastor to be my friend involves a lot more courage on his part than it does on my part. And part of real friendship is to be able to say to that, that friend, thank you for being my friend. It takes you a lot more courage. It takes a lot more risk on your part. You have to forgive me a whole lot more than I will ever have to forgive you for. So it's not just extending friendship, it's receiving the gift and grace of friendship. And part of that friendship, part of that getting near, at least in our mission as an urban church involved in community development, I want to be careful to say that I'm not implying that all African Americans are poor or all African American communities need community development. I don't, I know that's not to be true of parts of our, other parts of our community. But in our particular location, in an urban setting, in one of the poorest zip codes in our state, it, it happens to be that our neighborhood is predominantly African American and is predominantly poor. So if in our conviction that ministry always involves getting near because we're reflecting on the incarnation of Jesus Christ, you gotta get involved with your local neighborhood. And getting of all your local neighborhood means you've got to get with them. And a lot of times that means living near them. So uh, about uh, 100 people in our congregation, maybe 50 families, uh, have, uh, you know, whatever, however many families go into 100 people, but about that many people have moved into our immediate neighborhood, which was a very high-risk, at-risk neighborhood. And just by getting near, you discover who your neighbors are, what they need, what in friendship, what risk-taking will involve. And that has gained great traction, great credibility. That, by the way, was true in my uh, neighborhood that I came from in St. Louis, which was very different, which was uh, in the upper 1% in the 1% of the nation's uh, income level, uh, uh, all white and uh, uh, mostly retired. And we came to the conviction that we have to minister to our neighborhood and discover what friendship looks like there. What are the felt needs? That even well, rich people can be lonely and even rich people can be needy and need mercy. So in any kind of ministry, get right, repenting is appropriate, and getting near is appropriate, but especially if we're going to break down walls of racial separation. I'd say another point is that um, uh, it, we, we need to get right and we need to get near and we need to get real. Uh, one of my closest friends, I, I think I've, I've already referred to him, he's uh, African American and a prominent leader in our community. And he's taught me so much. Once we've really, once he really could trust me, he's, he's taught me so much. And so I got to the point where I could ask him questions as a critic looking at the outside. He was, he was exploring our church. He's since come into our church, but I, I got to the point where I could ask him real, real poignant questions. And so I asked him, uh, now, okay, you know us, you've worshiped with us, you looked at us from the outside in. What would you say about us? He said, I would say, that you are sincere. I know your heart. I know your heart. I know the heart of your leadership, the heart of your people. I know you are sincere about breaking down walls of racial separation. But it doesn't appear that you're authentic. I'm just going to tease that out. He said, I come in, it's all white. I look at the website, it's all white. Look at your staff, 
all white. And look at your leadership, mostly white. I don't know what to do about that exactly, he said. But eventually, if credibility, if other people are going to believe that you're sincere, there needs to be authenticity. In, in, in God's providence, I was reading a book at the time by Gerardo Marti on diversity in worship where he had, he, had, he had studied a broad spectrum of, well, he'd studied multi-ethnic churches across the country, and he discovered to his surprise that there was no one worship style that characterized multi-ethnic churches. They fell along the whole continuum of very low church to very high church. The common denominator, however, he said, was one relationship. Are, are you building relationships cross-racially in your church, in your community, so that people are trusting you and coming into your church? The other common denominator is racially ritualized leadership. And uh, what he meant was, by that was when someone comes into church, they see up front a non-majority culture representative. And there may not be anybody else there, but they say, well, at least I am valued at a very high level in this church. So we started planning more carefully to make sure there were non-white faces at the key entry points of our churches, our church, like welcoming on, in leading a prayer, reading scripture, um, uh, leading music, so forth. And, um, and then on our website, leading with, we do have, we did at the time had, have diverse members and we wanted to make sure they were prominently displayed in order to communicate, you are welcome here. And um, uh, then, uh, and there's a lot I could say about where God has led us in getting real, which means, which means also getting really active, doing real things, doing stuff, as my friend told me early on. Not just singing kumbaya together, doing stuff. So we've, it's easy to figure out the needs in an urban setting. They, they land at your doorstep. So we figured out early on kids in the projects need tutoring so they can be successful past the, so they can re learn to read before the third grade, otherwise just bad stuff happens after that. We early on knew that kids in the inner city needed beauty. So we started Arrow Institute for Art and Hope Ballet. We understood early on that, that uh, the poor were not getting uh, access to medical care. So a group of our church members started Christ Community Health Services 11 providers, dental therapy. Uh, a group from our church started Heritage Christian Academy in the, in the city, a college preparatory uh, day school. Uh, we've started Community Development Corporation, working with the justice uh, system to help people re-enter. On and on and on, we're doing stuff. But while we're doing stuff, we're trying to make sure that it's not just, it doesn't have our label on, doesn't lead with our label. And then we try as quickly as possible include our other evangelical partners who are mostly African American to say, why don't you jump on board with us? Let's do this together. Which we've, we're, we're trying to embrace the gospel uh, DNA, which says, gospel values, which says, whatever you have, give it away. Give it away. And it was, it, it was, it came home to us uh, recently when, or a couple, uh, last year, when a group of judges asked to meet with me, and uh, I didn't know them all, but they, they said, the, sh the sheriff sent us to you. Uh, we wanted, we're, we're, we're sick and tired of, of of these mandated uh, sentencing requirements that we have relative to guns and so forth, and, and we're just sending kids to prison. 
And so we don't know what to do. All we can do is throw the book at people. That's what we do as judges. But as human beings, as members of the community, we want to do something else. And so we went to the sheriff, and the sheriff said, well, if you want to work with church, a church, you need to work with First Pres, because they do stuff for the community, not just to get more people in their church. There are other churches like that. We're not the only one, but that was refreshing to hear, because that had not been our reputation uh, for a long time. And now we're partnering with other places in the city, uh, uh, working with their youth programs, holding community health fairs, uh, canvassing their community for health needs, holding children's fairs. And we put that church's name on it. We just provide the manpower and some resources, but it's that church that's doing the hosting. So getting real involves that. Final thing I would say is, is, is get ready. A couple of years ago, I was, we always have prayed this, I've prayed this prayer all my ministry, uh, Lord, cause our congregation to reflect the complexion of heaven. Lord, we can't convince this community that the gospel really, really does provide reconciliation between sinful people and a holy God. We can't convince them of that if it's not objectively demonstrated in our congregation that the gospel breaks down these human barriers. So we always prayed that prayer, reflect the completion. But I, that, that was ringing in my head what my friend said, you're sincere but not authentic. There needs to be some accountability. So I felt with my leadership at one point that we needed to make ourselves publicly accountable that we wanted to become a multi-ethnic congregation. And I mean that technically, according to missional experts, that you're at least 20% non-majority culture. So I challenged our people. I said, okay, we can do the math. We have 2,000 people, 20%, 400. Let's pray that God would bring 400 people of color to our congregation by 2020. Uh, we started that prayer a couple of years ago. Well, that's, everybody got excited about that. That's wonderful. And typical Presbyterians are saying, so what's the program? What are we going to do? What are we going to And you, you can't really put into effect an affirmative action program in evangelism or in diversity. Uh, and there were moments when I, and still moments when I'm afraid. What if that doesn't happen? What do we need to do to make that happen? And there's, there's nothing we can do other than what we've done. Lead with repentance. Listen very carefully. Listen very carefully to the African Americans and other minorities who are present, Hispanics and Asians as well, and asking them continually, this is your church. What are ways that we need to shape this church so that you feel comfortable bringing your friends here? We can do those things. But at the end of the day, the real effectiveness is going to come by prayer. Just like conversion. Conversion, reconciliation between sinful people and God only occurs by a miracle of the Holy Spirit. This kind of conversion only comes by a miracle of the Holy Spirit. And what we've seen is as we've prayed, and I pray it at times from the pulpit, and I'll use that number, uh, which you know, white people can sometimes be uncomfortable with that because they think that it might make African Americans or minorities feel uncomfortable, but the, I'm listening very carefully to the minorities, and the minorities said that by saying, by praying specifically for 400, for 20 percent to be a, a multi-ethnic congregation, that you're making yourself publicly accountable. It announces to us that we are valued and this mission is real. Every week for the last year, a new minority person has visited our church. 
And sometimes it's explained. It's the, the sensitivity of our people, proactively building relationships, striking conversations, inviting to the church. But many times there's no explanation for it. For instance, one woman showed up at our, in our congregation. I welcomed her and, and uh, I said, uh, so, so how, did you, how did you find us? And she said, well, I, I first found you on the web when I was in California, but I said, well, how did, how did you get here? She said, I don't know why I'm here. I don't know how I got here. I don't know why I'm standing here. I've been, I've been watching you on the web for six months and I was afraid to come. But today, the Holy Spirit must have pushed me out of bed into my car and into this sanctuary. And when that kind of thing happens, no one can pat themselves on the back. You can only brag on Jesus. What he's doing is the king of the church. In the last year, 30 to 50% of our new members' classes have been of minority people, people of color. We go around the room and ask, how did you get here? And each one is a miracle. And that's the, that's the greatest encouragement I'd give to any congregation. It's not a formula. It doesn't involve you becoming who you're not. It's not a gimmick. It's a prayer that King Jesus is eager to answer because it is the revelation of the mystery of the gospel. And um, we're seeing it happen in our denomination. We can see it happen in a congregation. Even if, if you're in a, in a location, even a, a small town where there's not racial diversity, there is diversity. There are people of various socioeconomic backgrounds and so forth that, that Jesus will get a name for himself in bringing into one place and calling brothers and sisters. Pray for it and get ready. He'll bring it. Thank you.